Welcome to Panel 2 in the corporeal, and I'm thrilled to introduce Titi Takamoto. Titi Takamoto is a queer Japanese American artist and scholar exploring the hidden dimensions of same sex intimacy that exists with, within Asian and Asian American archives. Takamoto interacts with found footage and archival materials through labor intensive processes of painting, lifting, and manipulating 16 millimeter, 35 millimeter film emulsion. By engaging with tactile and sensory dimensions of queer histories, Takamoto conjures up immersive fantasies involving butch surgeons, femme fish filleting, that's a lot of alliteration, and homoerotic bread making. The work honors queer Asian Americans who lived, loved, and labored together during the pre war era and beyond. Takamoto has published and exhibited widely and was awarded the Grand Jury Prize for Best Experimental Film and Slam Dance Film Festival and the Best Experimental Film Jury Award at the Austin Gay Lesbian International Film Festival. Takamoto is Dean of Humanities and the Sciences at California College of the Arts. Welcome, Dean Takamoto. Okay, hi everyone. I am so excited to be here. This is amazing. It's amazing to be having the BCS Symposium in person and also um, to introduce to you amazing scholars who I had the pleasure of working with two years ago um, in a class called Identities, Difference, and Power. So our first speaker is Liz Ordway. Liz is a body liberation artist and writer located in Oakland, California. She holds a BS in visual communication and design from San Francisco State University and is currently a dual degree candidate at California College of the Arts for a master's in fine arts and master's in visual and critical studies. Her work focuses on contributing to the visual field of fat studies with a blended analog and digital practice of photography, illustration, fiber sculptures, and experimental printing. Her paper is titled, The Power of Fat Liberation, Rereading Laura Aguilar's Nude Self-Portraits. Please welcome Liz. Thank you, Titi. Fat is not a bad word. Being fat is not a death sentence. And in fact, it's perfectly normal to be fat. Our society shames visible fatness, or for that matter, any flaws that stray from the thin, white, hetero body ideal. Yet, there is still so much considering, there is still so much to consider regarding how fat individuals view themselves. One way to harness the power of representation is through self-portraits. One is no longer the subject of anyone else's vision, but now is at the center of their own. This lesson was taught to me by spending time with the work of Laura Aguilar and how she engages with documenting her own fat body. Though Aguilar passed in 2018, she left behind a remarkable body of work that deserves further consideration. Today, I'll analyze three of Laura Aguilar's self-portraits by offering introductory themes from the fat studies field and its recent intersectional interventions to sincerely consider Aguilar's queer, fat, and Latinx identity expressed in her work. Today, I'll analyze, um, excuse me, one of Aguilar's earliest engagements with self-portraits is seen in her 1990s Clothed and Unclothed. The work displays two, by 20, two 16 by 20 inch gelatin silver prints of herself, one clothed and one naked. In the left image, she wears a short sleeve collared shirt designed with dark repeating floral patterns. A line of white buttons is slightly open, revealing her neck and upper chest. The shirt does not wrap to the contours of her body, but instead creates a boxy shape, disguising the abundant and lush curves of her figure. The pose and expression of this image are repeated in the image on the right, except she is naked. The soft contours of Aguilar's shoulders and arms become visible along with her collarbone and chest. Her large bell-shaped breasts meet the inside of her elbows where her waist begins. 
Just behind that, the curves of her stomach become visible as our eyes move down her body. Her lush abdomen is abundant and it peaks behind her arms and gently rounds down her legs. The shape of her hanging belly comes into focus near the center of this portrait. Excuse me. Aguilar reflects on, reflects on this work and states, I'm trying to allow the softness of myself to be out and represented in these photographs. I believe that the viewer is as vulnerable as the nude person in the clothed and unclothed series, because as they view the images, they are hopefully seeing images of themselves. In this work, Aguilar notes her artistic intentions of vulnerability while sharing her nude figure with the viewer. Art historian Amelia Jones elevates this claim and argues that this work evokes the power of naked vulnerability and is heightened by her unapolog unapologetic expression. As she maintains her unapologetic eye contact with the viewer, her vulnerability is strengthened through self-assurance. I argue that this vulnerability is heightened by her queer and Latinx identity. Body theorist Caleb Luna argues that colonial constructs of beauty labels fat, brown, queer femmes as ugly and undesirable. Aguilar chooses to center her multidimensional identity, which translates into a radical act of vulnerability in a politically charged world that rejects bodies like hers. The naked vulnerability she engages in forces the viewer to confront the potential discrimination instigated by body shame, homophobia, and racism. Fat, schol fat scholar Aubrey Gordon states that fat hatred and anti-fatness are umbrella terms that describe the attitudes, behaviors, and social systems that marginalize, exclude, and underserve and oppress fat bodies. They refer to the individual bigotry and the institutional policies designed to marginalize fat people. Fat scholar Virgie Tovar states, fat phobia employs individuals as scapegoats for anxiety about excess, immorality, and an uncontained relationship to desire and consumption. The treatment of fat people is a way to control the body size of all people. Visible hostile treatment towards fat people encourages our society to fear fatness and engage in violent discrimination. Aguilar, Aguilar offers the image of her naked figure to the viewer, making herself vulnerable to judgment and discrimination. We do not have full access to Aguilar's clothed or unclothed self. Instead, the trope of unclothing paired with her unapologetic eye contact makes us aware of her overall empowerment and strength. To expand upon Aguilar's engagement with self-expression, her 1996 Nature Self-Portrait Number 14 conjures previous themes of vulnerability and is amplified as she poses in a public setting. This portrait shows her gazing and reaching towards her reflection near a body of water. At the center, Aguilar's hanging belly and abundant rolls shine in the sun. Her body and the collection of water present an oasis amongst the emptiness of the dry and rough terrain. The small dark pond consumes the entire foreground where Aguilar's bright reflection beams towards her. The reflection mimics the rolling shapes of her contours and appears to ripple upon the water's surface. When reflecting on this work, Aguilar states, in these images, I feel beautiful. I feel very safe and comfortable. I have that sense of myself that I never had most of my life. And I'm very aware that I am a large person and that I'm not necessarily beautiful in the way that people think of beauty, but I can see my own beauty. Nature Self-Portrait Number 14 asks the audience to reconsider their internalized fat phobia and assumptions made about fat people. This image encourages the audience to consider her figure as natural as the landscape that she rests in. Yet, 
These considerations require the viewer to question stereotypes about fat bodies that claim they are unnatural. Resistance to resist belief is encouraged by what the medical industry fails to understand about body size. Weight bias research such as health at every size and the obesity paradox literature aims to explain how a host of variables affect our weight and size. Many of these variables, such as genetic predispositions, socioeconomic factors, such as access to fresh food and healthcare, are often out of our control. Furthermore, research shows that fat individuals have relatively higher survival rates than and similar metabolic health levels to their thin counterparts. Fatness does not explicitly correlate to disease. In other words, it's possible to be both fit and fat and unfit and thin. All bodies are valuable and deserve equal rights, and that is a belief that should be normalized. Aguilar's work gives us an opportunity to examine self-representation of fat figures, especially subjects that are queer people of color. In Aguilar's 1990 triptych, Three Eagles Flying, her nude figure is tightly wrapped in an American and a Mexican flag. Her face is covered by a large eagle devouring a snake atop of a cactus, while her lower half is topped with stars and stripes. A thick fibrous rope coils around her entirety and loops into a noose around her neck. Two additional flags hang in the background, illuminating her upbringing as Mexican-American. The inspiration of this work came from an experience that she had with a queer fundraising group planning a meeting to Mexico. She was hesitant to travel as she did not speak Spanish and was challenged by auditory dyslexia. After much convincing, she attended the conference and was ultimately disappointed by her experience. It was impossible to communicate and she felt outcasted as a fat person. She found extreme frustration in how the community assumed that she was butch because of her fatness and failed to recognize the femininity she noticeably felt after taking these images. In her own words, she states, I'm not butch. I might look it because I'm big and I always took butch with being more big or masculine. And I didn't think I was masculine at all. And that's why it was a big thing when I did Three Eagles Flying. It was like the first time I saw my body. I saw the shapes of the shadows from the lights on my breasts. It really changed how I saw my body. Aguilar expresses dissonance between the internal and external perceptions of her fat body. This emotional tension wrapped up in her queer and Latinx identity mirrors the tension of the flags wrapped around her body. First, to understand the inherent tension of fabric, we need to extrapolate on the process of cloth making. All cloth comes from fibrous materials that are harvested, dried, shredded, and spun. These fibers are then woven into fabric, creating tension amongst each locked thread. Furthermore, textiles are a primary signifier that distinguishes nature from culture and thereby remains forever linked to its cultural significance. The roots of both her Latinx and American identity are embedded in the flags that restrain her body. Art historian Deborah Cullen argues that Aguilar's face is literally beneath the crucifixion of the eagle's talons on the American flag and presents a symbolic expression of the effects of U.S. colonization. However, Mexican historian Ricardo Cañas Montalovo states, the eagle is one of the few animals that no matter how injured will never crawl. It continues to fly no matter what, a situation that resonates to all Mexicans despite their circumstances always persevere. Aguilar may be experiencing what Cullen states as a crucifixion, yet her face is covered in a symbol of triumph. Aguilar is engaged in an act of resistance towards a group of peers 
but could not perceive her sexuality as feminine due to her fat status. Additionally, the American flag wrapped around her body carries unique tension that is inherent to our relationship with fatness and race. Scholar and educator Sabrina Strings uncovers an archive of race-centered studies to produce a historical examination of the origin of the thin ideal and the development of fat hatred rooted in anti-blackness. In the text, Fearing the Black Body, the Racial Origins, a Fat Phobia, Sabrina Strings argues that the roots of present day fat phobia stem from religious and scientific shifts of the Enlightenment period, impacted by the transatlantic slave trade and the rise of Protestantism. Racial and religious fears of excess considered blackness as excess to the ideal US racial identity. Strings text outlines the key formations and the sociocultural and political factors that defend the tethering of racism to the body and contributes to current size biases. The American flag restraining Aguilar's body symbolizes the destructive aftermath of colonization, the active discrimination towards people of color, and the racial beginnings of fat phobia. Three Eagles Flying displays a rich and complex expression where her fatness is woven into her queer and Latinx identity. Studying Aguilar's nude self-portraits through the lens of intersectional fat studies allows us to consider how her work values the unique qualities of the fat identity beyond the overstudied white hetero figure. Body liberationists such as Caleb Luna, Virgie Tovar, and Sabrina Strings have made critical interventions to the field to deeply consider the varieties of identities within fat studies. Here, the goal is to not speak on behalf of Aguilar, but instead inform how her work contributes to the visual field of intersectional fat studies. And I hope you understand now why fat is not a bad word. Thank you. Um, I'm delighted to introduce Alia Parashar, who is an interdisciplinary artist who works in the mediums of fibers and materials, as well as installation art, in order to communicate the intersection of gender identity, post-colonial theory, and mythology. She strives to strike a balance between celebrating femininity and honoring bodies, while creating a vision of resistance through garments and, fabri uh, and fiber production. Her work has been featured at Shuba, Paper, Post, Crux, and Posture Magazine, with her most recent show taking place at Acre Projects in 2019. Alia holds a BFA from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago after transferring from Otis College of Art and Design. She is now pursuing her MA, MFA dual degree at California College of the Arts in San Francisco, graduating in May of 2022. Her paper is titled, Towards a Transsexual Dwelling in Yantra Studies. Please welcome Alia. Towards a dwelling, towards a transsexual dwelling in Yantra studies. Yantras are a familiar and significant genre of Indian art, and of particular importance to aesthetics and metaphysics. Traditional interpretations of the Yantra emphasize binary embodiment, most closely associated with the cisgender male and female being, when, as I will argue, the structure of the Yantra is inherently one that contains elements of transition, not division. The yantra allows for a transsexual dwelling, both phenomenologically and visually. The inherent logic of the yantra structure, as found throughout tantric scholarship and art, is based on embodiment. Nevertheless, yantras are created and interpreted within a cisgendered male and female symbolism binary. 
A call for the reading of the transsexual body allows for transsexual people to see a reflection of themselves inherently in Hindu mythology. I argue that concentrating on the following features of the yantra, one, the orientation of objects, two, the structural logic of the form, and three, the relationship to the body, develops the possibility for the reading of a transsexual dwelling in yantra studies. First, let's look at defining the yantra. Madhukanna, an Indian scholar focused in tantric philosophy, describes yantras in two ways in her text, Yantra, the tantric symbol for cosmic unity. First, we see yantras as a phenomenological concept, as any kind of mechanical contrivance which is harnessed to aid an enterprise. A yantra in this sense, therefore, is any sort of machine or instrument used in architecture, astronomy, alchemy, chemistry, warfare, or recreation. Additionally, the tangible manifestation of the yantra's definition is in the mystic yantra, which are aids and the chief instruments of meditative discipline. Basically, a yantra used in this context and for this purpose is an abstract geometrical design intended as a tool for meditation and increased awareness. In this presentation, through the visual analysis of the Vastu Purush Mandal, Sri Yantra, and a contemporary rendition of the yantra from my artistic practice, I argue that the transsexual body is inherently involved in this reading. The body justifies itself through tantric philosophy studies and transgender theory. There is a trans mythos that dwells in the structure and the logic of the yantra, the transsexual body existing through orientations, transition, and self-reference in a visual rendition. The metaphysical lies behind every work of Indian art since the yantra structure is inherently mythic. In my argument, I bridge the gap between the yantra and the transsexual body through metaphysics and myth. Transsexuality and transitions. What does it mean to transition? <clears throat> there is a violence in transition at first, a transition towards rejection, sadness, and rebalancing. However, eventually we get to find beauty in the process of growing and blooming into femininity breastbud and they feel like a welcome home from the gestures of rejection, I come back to something I thought I lost when I was a child, something I wished I had. Hips grew wider, fat redistributed, and my heart grew more porous. I felt as if there was a material shift in my body and the embodiment of my femininity in my mind pushed itself outwards, bulging in sections of my body at a velocity in which it felt like it was exploding. Maybe it was more of a slow burst, but it felt relative at the time. Thinking about that burgeoning now, it seemed hasty. It felt like part of the way time moved outside of human beings was parallel to my body. Universes expanded and black holes exploded where my stomach and heart were, sending stars to the edges of my body and healing my interiors through its violence. Maybe it wasn't a violence after all, or maybe it wasn't a net violent situation. Something had to be cut up to be sutured again, and it had to be my body. I sacrificed myself to me for the final time right before I blossomed during surgery. I sacrificed myself for the final time again and again. Every time I woke up, I was reborn. Why I focus on this particular subject position and why transsexuality? Transsexuality, in my definition, has a focus in bodies who have been biologically affected through medical transition. Ava Hayward, a trans scholar focusing on trans phenomenology, speaks upon transition in her research and in her paper, Spider Room. Extrapolating, by transitioning, I do not mean a monolithic movement between states. Rather, I mean simply an emergence of a material, physical, sensual, and social self through corporal, spatial, and temporal processes that transfigure the lived body. Here we see a linking of transition transition to the transsexual body within the transgender umbrella. My research applies to this subject position. Transsexuality as trans phenomenology is prioritized in this definition. Moving on to the Sri Yantra, considering the embodied transgender dwelling. What is the Sri Yantra? The Sri Yantra is a representation of the union between Siva and Sakti, a visual geometric rendition of the birthing of the cosmos and Shakti and Siva as cisgender embodiment. Their body is iterated as a manifestation of geometry. Wendy Donager, an endologist, 
Her essay makes clear the ritual worship of Siva and Sakti through Siva's metaphorical linga or phallus and Sakti's yoni or vagina is clear. There is an implication that cisness is applied to the Hindu gods in such reading. Here we see the bindu, the bold dot centered in the middle of the diagram. Sarah Ahmed focuses on the idea of orientations. She's a queer scholar and focuses on disorientations and orientations as they're related to sexual orientations. However, I argue that this theory can be applied to trans studies because of its close associations to phenomenology. Disorientation exists near the bindu. Orientations of the body are in context to cisgender embodiment. Triangles are, triangles are dictating cisgender and heterosexual orientations. This is to say Sakti and Siva. Triangles pointing upwards representing Shiva and the triangles pointing downwards representing Sakti. The orientations associated with their cisgender embodiment is disoriented near the bindu, as we can see here. The disorientation allows for a trans swelling. Now you may ask, where are the disorientations located? They manifest in the inability to easily recognize and count all configurations of the triangle in the yantra structure and near the bindu. If disorientation lies near the beginning point of the cosmos, can we not say that the inherent being of the metaphysical nature of the yantra is transsexual? Disorientation here is inherently near the point of the divine. Their union produces a visual disorientation. It produces itself as trans phenomenology in the image. Moving on to transsexual phenomenology in the Indian image, metaphysics and object, shape, and likeness. And why metaphysics? What is the Indian way of viewing artwork? Point number two in Kumaraswamy's text within the metaphysical school of viewing art is the Indian image is not the likeliness of any earth model, but an ideal representation or symbolization of a mental image having for its referent a divine or metaphysical order of being. As it is concerned with Indian art, representation in the context of the yantra is the correspondence between shapes and imagery that acclimates itself with tantric philosophy. This acclimation is to say that the metaphysical nature of the yantra cannot be removed from its reading. Phenomenology is inherently present in the Indian mode of viewing artwork, being as it's linked to existence, experience, and embodiment in the Indian image, a transsexual body can be read for interpretation based on the phenomenology of transness existing in the image, then may it be with its associations with shape and image, or it's linked to being as associated with trans representation and identity. The Vastu Purush Mandal, a history of path and body within the grid. Before beginning the analysis of the Vastu Purush Mandal, let's break down the exact meaning we will be using Khanna's definition of the word. Vastu, meaning bodily existence or sight. Purusha, meaning the supreme principle or source of the cosmos. And Mandal, a closed polygonal figure. The body is rooted in the Sri Yantra and references it in its meaning and making. The Vastu Purush Mandal is a Yantra structure gridded around the body. The Vastaburush Mandal is a prime example of the Mandal structure translated into an architectural diagram. It is used as a blueprint for Indian structures. The temple, home, or physical planning often follows this as a guideline, but not a strict requirement. The Vastaburush Mandal itself has dated back to the Vedic era. Moreover, one of its uses is to develop the theory of the Yantra as it intersects with architectural tradition. Mandala and Yantra can be interchanged here as they are traditions of structures radiating outwards in terms of hierarchical ideology. Moreover, they are both structures relying on a central point from which to move outwards. This particular iteration of the Vastu Purush Mandal follows the Vastu Purush laid upon the Mandal itself. Vastu Purush is the body shape in the center of the Vastu Purusha Mandal. Also known as the spirit of the site, it is the graft of a mythological being into the Yantra structure. The Vastu is oriented in a particular direction diagonally. The torso of the Vastu is in the center of the diagram, taking up spaces in boxes 1, 2, 4, and 5. While the rules dictate a methodology to build the guide upon a body, it is essential to keep in mind that the body always comes back to being the central concept of the image, both visually and even through the making of the structure conceptually. This body is one that the grid places itself around. 
the grid is placed around the body to make sense of the object. Here we notice that the grid, as we see it, functions as a straightening device, as it works to make sense of the object placed into it or around it. We can use Ahmed's understanding of the normative dimension to refer to straight bodies. The grid here is something that I place in the normative dimension in that it works to make sense of and create a means to approach the body. It is the factor that makes the body diagonal in its orientation and compartmentalized straight lines. Kilata Hoi Yantra and the possibility for a transsexual dwelling. My work, Kilata Hoi Yantra, or Blooming Yantra, is a collage of layered pieces of black and white Xerox copies of my body, intersecting with a pre-existing yantra itself. The ink markings of the original drawings are placed into the photocopied prints, which have been expanded, cut, rotated, and photocopied. Finally, collaged to create a landscape of layered curvilinear imagery. Kilata Hoi Yantra references implicitly the problematic sisha orientations and gendering mentioned earlier. Hindu and Tantric ritualistic methods speak of the body as a root for self-definition. One spoken of was the concept of the body yantra and the involvement of the mythic body throughout the analysis and core structures of the yantra itself. Nisha Ramaya, a British Indian scholar and writer, speaks upon self-definition of the body concerning transformation, transmutation, and meditation. Like the images consistent in traditional yantras, the lotus leaves, bindus, circles, and triangle shapes, my body embeds itself into the diagram of the yantra. In this sense, they're similarly using the logic of the Vastu Purush Mandal as a point of divergence for this particular work. Layers do not just appear at the forefront of this diagram. Additionally, they create a different composition behind the current presentation. You can actually see this layered curvilinear imagery if you look to the top left corner of the image. It's a slightly lower value image that's towards the back of the yantra. In this sense, they're similarly using the Vastu Purush Mandal as a point of divergence for this work. Layers do not just appear at the forefront of this diagram. Additionally, they create a different composition behind the current presentation. On the right, we see the skewed bindu from the central point of the image, which is towards the right, and displaces the concrete structure of the yantra. Additionally, it complicates it. This gesture turns it from an image that radiates outwards from the center to an image with two radiation points, specifically with two bindus. The theory of creation is located around the bindu. Additionally, the proximity of disorientation to the bindu and the Sri yantra calls for a transsexual dwelling. The multiplicity of the transsexual being and dwelling, longevity is not guaranteed and its reproduction is linked to the theory of creation within yantra studies. The trans body becomes the site of reproduction, directly opposing the cishet hegemony. I make this work where there's a heightened awareness of trans bodies occupying space in our social ecologies. With that increased awareness, we see a coupling of violence and visibility. We deem transsexual people as bodies living on the fringes of society, via short bursts, in doing so, we are inherently disrespected, cast aside, and not allowed entrance into discourse about respect, space, and time. As my creative work and my scholarly analysis of Yantra studies makes clear, there is an availability to show the divine inherently imbued into transsexual bodies. In this, the Yantra's ethos becomes a generating tool for the divine and to imbue, divini and to imbue divinity onto the transsexual woman's body. The transsexual body is then the body yantra used to connect to the divine, as its existence carves out spaces and cis reality. Her body is consistently reflecting and noticing its lack of stasis, movement as being the inherent state of divinity, transformation, and evolution which rests as a divine. Her body is the live rendition of her home, made by and of herself. Her existing as the bindu and the yantra as the world radiates outwards towards her, or outwards from her. She becomes the point at which space begins as a response to her surroundings to change or to reject. There is no liminal response to her existing as a radiating force, which is in mythos. When the transsexual woman cannot see her divinity, the result is a fervent loss of identity and meaning. When her mythos has been removed from her environment, 
Is it not up to us to restore it? Thank you so much. the viewer is invited to look from the point of view of the artist. And there's a way in which there's a different kind of empathy there, right? To actually see through the artist's eyes. Right? Um, and I was also struck by the, the quote that you pulled from the artist, um, her assertion that the viewer is as vulnerable as the nude person that they're seeing in the image. So can you say more about that sense of shared vulnerability, how she produces that in the image itself, and then also how that shared vulnerability becomes a radical act of vulnerability, which is, I think, your greater assertion that you make. Lovely question, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I would definitely, definitely state that Aguilar's choice of self-portraiture uh, kind of mentioned in my presentation, centers herself, how she views herself, and how she chooses to allow others to look at her. She is the point and the conduit of consent in the situation, and she is not subject to another artist's interpretation of her body. So this work becomes radical, and a radical collective act of vulnerability because Aguilar is engaging with revealing her body to a world that is fatphobic, homophobic, and racist. These are things that we know, and I believe that when one person occupies those identities, they are fully aware of that as well. I can only speak on behalf of being a fat person, but I do know that when one shares their body, they are opening up themselves to any potential discrimination, judgment, and anyone else's internalized fat phobia or homophobia or racism that they are then projecting on the viewer or projecting on that um, portrait. So as she exposes her body, becomes vulnerable, she is then also encouraging the audience to say, you can do this too. This is possible. You do not have to hide. You can be here. That radical act of vulnerability encourages the viewer to take something away from that and hopefully engage in some type of self-acceptance regardless of the status of their body. Great, thank you so much. Um, well, Alia, listening to your presentation, I was reminded of the compelling work that you did two years ago um, on, on fabric and the idea of the cross grain and the straight grain um, of the fabric and how the diagonal orientation of the bias, these are all vocabularies that I learned from, <laughs> from Alia two years ago, but that the diagonal orientation of the bias um, uh, is uh, not just something that um, folks in textiles do when you, correct me again if I'm wrong, but if you cut on the bias, that it actually enables the fabric to mold to the body to shape to the body in a way that's really different than the kind of rigidness of, of the other two dimensions, the straight and the cross. Um, and that you argue that that ability to drape is a kind of trans draping. And I just um, was so struck by how your current work has, um, it resonates with this idea of the trans body occupying this diagonal space um, and as a space of empowerment and possibility 
And also, I was really struck by, in this case, it's a space of, of dwelling, and that the grid is arranging itself around the body rather than the other way around. So can you talk about that, how, uh, how you think those, those two um, investigations together? Thank you so much for your question. Um, I'm really honored that you remembered my work from two years ago. Um, I think that when I was looking at my work currently versus when I was doing the work with fabric, I really was focusing on the fact that, you know, the term cross grain, straight grain, bias are actually terms used in English, right? Named in English for a colonial context. I was trying to find transsexuality as an availability within this colonial and rigid context. When I was doing this work, I was, you know, consequently actually focusing on almost like Hindu concepts of diagonality or the diagonal, really trying to think about how Western queer theory could influence Eastern thinking and Eastern phenomenology, Eastern um, philosophy. And, you know, I was kind of critiqued for um, <laughs> looking at it in too much of a binary. But I think that that binary is where these like really interesting conversations form. You find the idea of stretching, moving, holding, um, that kind of gives us an availability to look at the diagonal in many different ways. Um, so in short, you know, I guess I, guess I was focusing on um, my work with the bias, my work with the drape, as a kind of westernized concept, and then focusing on the body and diagonal as an Indian mode of viewing, or more specifically, a tantric mode of viewing um, the body. Uh, I have been interested in the transsexual dwelling for a while now, and I just love to explore the possibilities that it can exist in. I think that there's so much availability um, for that, and my subject position is so nuanced that I feel like, I'm not saying I have the authority, but like, I feel, I feel good at answering these questions. Um, yeah, I hope that answered. Yeah, that was great. Thank you so much. Oh, Thank you. So I'd love to open it to the floor. Please raise your hand and we'll also pass the microphone. And if you need a moment to think some more. Oh, there, we have a hand up. We can also gather questions. Hi, uh, this is a question for Aliyah. Um, you talked about the Yatra as, as kind of a technology, um, kind of at the beginning, um, or maybe like a set of cultural techniques. But I'm also really struck by your use of xerography uh, and like the history of a technology, like Isaac Gittleman writes about it as a really bureaucratic technology. Um, and so I see your intervention happening kind of against this cultural form, but also like through this through this tool that was developed for a much more kind of rigid, bureaucratic means. I was wondering if you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, totally. Um, thank you for your question. Um, so, you know, I, I focused on the idea that multiplicities create a mythology. And that's so apparent with the yantra, you know, with uh, the imagery being reused again and again. So you see the lotus leaves, circles, triangles. And if there is enough of a repetition maybe in that repetition there's an availability for a mythology. So, you know, when you speak about bureaucratic, um, the bureaucratic use of Xeroxing, I think that's, I don't want to misinterpret what you're saying. Um, I really think that there's a possibility to find something in repetitions outside of what we're forced to see in Xerox. Uh -huh. I mean, ultimately, I think about it as the concept of just copying and repasting and cutting and copying and repasting. If there's enough of a visual language that's created out of the transsexual body, hopefully there will be a room for divinity to dwell there. More specifically, I like to think of you know my body as the divination point. That's something that I've been working on for like the past few years. Um, and I really think about how can we turn it on its side to the point in which we are able to reuse it to create a language. And you know, language, visually, sound-wise, um, linguistically, I am so interested in using these structures to just subvert everything we know about the ideas of transsexuality and repetition. 
um, especially its use of mythology. You know, like thinking about mythology and metaphysics as it's related to like digital tools. How wild is that? Like, we see that in you know spiritual settings, healings, um, sound bowls, like all of these really important meditative techniques, but rarely in digital tools. Um, and I think that that's so powerful and so interesting. Um, there's such an availability for exploration there, and that's fun. <laughs> Um, thank you, Aliyah, Liz, and Titi. Uh, for the sake of time, we have uh, one actual special, another highlight. So um, thank you for the lovely panel. is proud to present the annual alumni award to Dorothy C. Santos, who graduated in the BCS class of 2014. Professor Santos is a scholar, artist, curator, and educator who is currently pursuing a PhD at the University of California, Santa Cruz, in the film and dig digital media program as a Eugene B. Cotto Robles fellow. She is scheduled to complete her doctoral work next year. She's also the co-founder of Refresh, a politically engaged art and curatorial collective, and she is the executive director of the Processing Foundation, a nonprofit that seeks to promote both software literacy in the visual arts, as well as visual literacy within the tech community, all the while making both fields more accessible to diverse and underserved communities. Her path on embarking on this important work was spurred by her time at the CCA where she completed her MA thesis research on virtual spaces like Second Life and how they can serve as a venue for subversive performance art. Since her time at the CCA and through today, Santos has published extensively with work appearing in Art Journal, Art 21, Rhizome, Art in America, Motherboard, and Ars Technica, to name just a few. Her essay on cyborgs and social media was included in the 2017 Routledge Anthology on Biology and Art and Architecture. As an artist, her work delves into computational aesthetics, open source dynamics, and has been exhi exhibited at Ars Electronica, the Fort Mason Center for Arts and Culture, the GLBT Historical Society, to name also just a few. She is also a 2020 recipient of the prestigious Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, YBCA 10, Prize for Interdisciplinary Thinkers, who are working on some of the most urgent issues of our day including racial justice and climate equality. And while she's clearly been busy, Santos hasn't been away from the CCA for very long. In 2019, she moderated a program co-organized by the Queer Culture Center of San Francisco, hosted here, which looked at trans queer intimacies and the arts. And we are so grateful to have her here again today. The class of 2022 has chosen Professor Santos for her prescient and insightful work in new media and for her work as an activist in making the virtual and visual realms more, a more inclusive and accessible place. It is our distinct pleasure today to honor her with the coveted bronze pencil. My talk today is named on bending time and space because we just kind of <laughs> low-key did that. Um, also, I've never won anything like, or won or awarded or whatever. It's just, I'm sorry, it's just, I feel like I'm winning today. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, but thank you so much. And just again, can we give a round of applause to the MF or the MA MFA <laughs> graduates of VCS? That's really incredible. Um, yeah, first of all, uh, thank you so much to Professors Jackie Francis, Via Lei, Patricia Lang, and Titi Takamoto, and to the Visual and Critical Studies Department for inviting me to return to the place that continues to serve as a strong foundation to the work I do now. Most importantly, 
I don't know where they are. I want to extend my deepest gratitude to the brilliant scholars we're celebrating today. Catherine Hamilton, Liz Hafey, Liz Ordway, Alia Parashar, and Kristen Warwick. Congratulations, and I look, yes, can just, I look forward to all of your wonderful work here after being in conversation and expanding upon the ideas you all brought forth today. So many of you are probably wondering, who is this person? Ooh, that's too much. Who are you? <laughs> and this is a small fraction of the roles I play in my life. I oftentimes feel capitalism forces us to believe we can only be specific things to specific people and places when we are actually a vast multitude of feelings, experiences, and sensations. I also understand that at any given moment, I have the capacity to shape shift because some people need familiarity. They need an anchor towards beginning to understand me and what matters most to me. All that being said, I'm in a constant state of writing, making, teaching, and most importantly, observing. Now, the use of present progressive tense is intentional here. Abram Stern, a fellow artist who I both love and adore, has taught and reminded me that we're always in an ongoing state of becoming. We're always living, and hopefully, in each moment. Now that here you might, you already saw this picture, but <laughs> you may see a vintage sepia toned image of a curious child holding a phone receiver, extending out to a person outside the frame with a brocade gold and yellow curtains in the background. This photo has boomeranged its way back into my life because my current research and creative practice focuses on voice recognition, speech generation, and assistive technologies. I love the human voice. I love listening to it, I love studying it, and finding its edges and contours, which I know seems strange considering it's not something we can touch, but it most certainly can be felt. When I was young, I loved talking on the phone and I would even pretend talking to gods and spirits. I was imagining. Looking at this picture again after many years, I can't help but think of this version of myself, joyful, curious, and mischievous. But I'm not sure I'm gonna talk about bending time and space. I will, because I learned how to bend time and space when I was roaming these concrete halls, staying up till the wee hours of the morning, probably finishing a paper for Professor Takamoto, or getting a drink with classmates at the Parkside, listening to punk and metal music while eating an inordinate amount of tater tots. Yet there's this one thing I've been returning to regarding my fantastical ideas of time travel. I learned about Doreen Macy's idea of time-space compression, taking a capstone seminar here my first year of the program, it's a concept that involves understanding our proximity to other places and people through the spectrum of technological tools we use to connect with one another. Imagine Zoom, probably not that difficult considering the difficult and challenging circumstances we've had to deal with the past few years, but also think about text messages, video chats, phone calls, email messages as examples that fall within this spectrum. Now, when I first tried to understand this way of seeing the world, I didn't quite get it. Much like a lot of the theory I read while I was here. <laughs> but many of those readings, essays, and books I cited and sometimes felt like throwing up against the wall have returned time and time again to show me the roots and the rhizome of what drives my work in new media, digital art, education, open source software, visual and critical studies, because I inhabit all of those spaces. Blasting us into the far future, well, at least far from the four-year-old that you saw holding a phone larger than their head, I bring you into a space, albeit a digital one, I didn't believe was possible. This photo of three human beings in conversation, one with a backdrop of books on black shelves, 
another person against a crimson brick wall and painting overhead, and another sitting against a corner of a room on an orange patterned armchair depicts a generative and thought-provoking conversation between artists and writers. That being on the upper right-hand corner, Brian Dracourt, and on the bottom rectangular box there is a Rafael Lozano Hemmer. The first chapter of my master's thesis was on Rafael's work. And years later, I would have the opportunity to speak with him about the uses and misuses of tech and why artists ought to be given all the tools to unmake and remake the world. I share this moment because I never thought when I was writing about his work a decade ago that I would have the opportunity to dialogue about how his practice has evolved and how it's continued to influence the ways I write and the ways that I make. As you can tell, I'm not one to talk about my research and creative practice when time is of the essence, because there's only so much I can communicate about how I have evolved from the physical space of these classrooms and hallways to where I am now. But I will share the best way I could what I feel about visuality, critical thought, and what studying has meant to me since my time here at CCA and the role each has played. First, you can't give primacy to vision alone. It gives you all the right amount of information to begin to understand, yet the mind's eye plays a key role in how you envision. Second, vision is only a fraction of what it means to take in the world. The rest of your senses start to heighten to go beyond the seeing. You begin to sense with all that is in you. Lastly, Studies is both a noun and a verb. And that's a little nod to Bell Hooks who has taught us about love, because that too is a verb and a noun. You have to understand what you do, what you write, and what you make are all a part of a continuum with effects you will not know immediately, and maybe not understand until much later on. Now the irony for me, in obtaining a degree in visual and critical studies, is that I learned a decade later, as I stand before you all, and to reiterate, is to look is not just with your eyes, but with all you are. There is a Filipina, Visayan or Filipino, Visayan deity named the Dalikamata, born into an alternate dimension with thousands of eyes so that she is truly all-seeing. And the species most connected to her spirit are that of butterflies and owls, some of my favorite non-humans. And I've always understood her eyes as symbolic of being able to see with all the senses, not just sight. That is another thing I learned from my studies and studying here, that there is always more than the eyes can see. And as one of my longtime collaborators and dearest friend, Xiaowei Arwang, reminds me that the archetype of the hanged one is not only about seeking a higher level of consciousness by suspending our beliefs and perceptions to welcome in new knowledge, but that we must flip our entire being to have the heart above the mind, above the brain. And this takes intense intellectual, emotional, and physical labor yet is absolutely necessary in the world we live in, now more than ever. I'll end with a reminder from another good friend I met during my time here at CCA, artist and writer Indira Allegra. They shared some sage wisdom from poet Lucille Clifton recently that I feel is of the utmost importance to you as you complete this epic and extraordinary milestone, Catherine, Liz H., Liz O., Alia, and Kristen. People wish to be poets more than they wish to write poetry, and that's a mistake. One should wish to celebrate more than one wishes to be celebrated. So I gently ask, okay, I urge each of you to not just celebrate today, but find moments to celebrate every day. And may you always remember your powers of bending time and space.
Congratulations. Class of 2022, I congratulate you on your work today and throughout the academic year and your time at CCA. No doubt the virtual audience, as well as the realized audience here, family, friends, colleagues, CCA and VCS alums, recognize your achievements and are inspired of it, inspired by it. We are proud of you and we hope that you are proud of yourselves. Please mark this moment with another round of applause. You have given us a model of success and of making ways to share your rigorous research, analysis, informed interpretation, and compelling writing about art, object making, and visual cultural production and related rhetorics. We share in your triumphs and we will keep our eyes and ears open for your future work. Um, thank you so much for sharing with it with us today. For those who are here on the CCA campus, we will now head outdoors for a reception and toast to the graduates and to their support teams. For those watching and listening elsewhere in the world, thank you for joining us today. We bid you farewell and take good care. So long.